Thank you for this opportunity of being with you today. I want to thank the elders personally for their invitation on this first Monday in October uh, to come and first Sunday in October, did I say Monday? You know, a man told me recently, he said, as I get older, my memory's not what it used to be. And also, as I get older, my memory's not what it used to be. <laughs> And that happens. But anyway, this Lord's Day is an opportunity to be with you, and I always appreciate that, appreciate your great hospitality. Uh, and the work that you're doing, not just associated with uh, the work I'm necessarily engaged in, but all the works that you do, whether it's local and throughout the world. And so it's a privilege to be with you, and thank you so very, very much. You might open your Bibles again to 1 John chapter 5, as we noted in verses 4 and 5 in our reading this morning. We have the subject of victory. I think we're all interested in victory. It may be that some of us have some favorite sports teams, and we always want them to have the victory. Those victories, however, are short-lived, sometimes from week to week. But we want to talk about another victory this morning that hopefully everyone here will enjoy. And that is victory in our Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks be unto God for the victory that we have in Christ Jesus, according to what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 57. But in our text, we've come across a phrase that says, and 1 John chapter 5 and verse 4, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. And so we sometimes sing, faith is the victory. Well, no doubt it's based upon this particular text. And the purpose of our sermon this morning is to show that through faith, the Christian can overcome the world. We are in a battle. It's a battle for our, our souls, the souls of our loved ones. We need to be victorious in this battle. In our text, he says, of being born again. Who is he that overcometh the world? He that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. Whosoever is born of God, he says in verse 4, overcometh the world. Who is it that is born again? Well, a born again person is a person who is a Christian, a child of God. He's experienced then the new birth mentioned in John chapter 3, Verses 3 through 5, being born of the water and of the Spirit. Or as Peter puts it in 1 Peter 1 and verse 22, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. So God has begotten us through his word, directed, of course, by the Holy Spirit, as we mentioned in John 3 and verse number 5. We submitted to our Lord in water and being baptized for the remission of our sins. And consequently, Jesus says that is being born again, born anew. Those who are not born of God have not overcome the world. Even though they may be prospering materially, physically, they're not prospering spiritually because they haven't been born of God. In fact, those who are not born of God, not only have they not overcome the world, they have been overcome by the world. The world has overcome them. So Paul writes to the, Christ, uh, to the Christians in Rome, in Romans 6 and verse 16, But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. And so it is then one who has been born of God, born again or born of God, 
is one who has overcome the world. This is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. But I want us to notice something in this text. As he's writing to Christians and he says, this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. I notice that the word overcometh in the King James uh, Version ends in an E-T-H ending. And what the translators are then trying to express to us in this E-T-H ending is that this is continuous in action. It is not then just because I was baptized into Christ that that guarantees all of uh, my ticket, if you will, uh, between here and heaven. But rather, this is a constant battle that we face. And I think you know this as a child of God. If you've been a Christian very long, you know the temptations that come our way. You know the trials that come into our lives. But yet we can continue to overcome. It's continuous action. Therefore, it's a constant conflict. It's a constant conflict in this world. It's a constant battle. But here's the good news in this text then. The Christian is one who keeps on overcoming. It's not a one-time thing. It's not aorist tense. It's not a punctiliar, if you will. Just come to a point and you say, well, I overcame. I did that in 19-whatever uh, or 20-whatever. No, this is something that we do every day. We face new battles sometimes every day. Maybe in new shapes and new forms. Maybe old battles. But the point is this. We can keep on overcoming them. We can live victoriously. We sometimes sing the song, Blessed Assurance. As we go through life then, we need this assurance. We overcome the world. The cosmos of evil. Now, in this overcoming, and pictured in this, is an adversary. Who is our adversary? Well, he's the prince of this world. In John chapter 12 and verse number 31, Jesus says, Now is the prince of this world cast out. In other words, Jesus has given us the assurance that through him that we are victorious over the prince of this world. But that doesn't mean he doesn't afflict us today or tempt us today or that he's not active today. But we have a system through which we can overcome the world. And it involves the blood of Christ, but it involves also our faith. So we learn in 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober, be vigilant, watchful. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary... The devil walketh about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. There's the constant battle then. The evils that are in this world. And I'm reminded of what Paul tells us in Ephesians 6, 10 following that he wants us to be, God wants us to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. He wants us to put on the whole armor of God because there's a conflict here. And having done all to stand, to stand in the evil day. So it's not time yet for us to take off the Christian armor because we're in a battle. But we are guaranteed a victory through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But Peter says that Satan is our adversary. So there's the enemy. Paul said we're not ignorant of his devices, 2 Corinthians 2.11. So he uses devices and tricks and various guiles or means of guile that he might uh, lead us away. But we've got to determine to be strong in the faith, be strong in the Lord. And so if we are strong in the Lord, we'll be assured of the victory. Notice, if you will, let's go back to 1 John chapter 5, and let's note here very carefully, just in a casual reading, why it is a joy and serving the Lord, and His commandments are not grievous to us. In 1 John chapter 5, starting in verse 1, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone that loveth Him that begat, loveth Him also that is begotten of Him. In other words, we love God, and we love one another as His children. 
By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and keep His commandments. Now ask yourself this question, do I love God? Do I love the brethren? Well, do I keep His commandments? He says, there's the test. Now if I love God, and if I love the brethren, it's not going to be hard to keep His commandments. For he says, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. And watch this. And his commandments are not grievous. It is not grievous to us to actually serve someone whom we love. And so this is for our betterment. This is for our victory. The commandments of God are for our victory. It strengthens our faith. And we in turn love God because of that. And consequently then it is not a grievous thing to be a child of God. Unfortunately, some people who have not developed the way that they should think that it is grievous. And we ask such questions. Do I have to be here on Sunday night? Do I have to attend all of the services? Do I have to give a certain amount? You see, it sounds like it's something that's drudgery. Do I have to mow the yard? Do I have to, <laughs> as a teenager may ask, or do I have to go work in the field? Do I have to go to something we don't delight in? But friends, I think it's a great job. David said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Friends, I want to go to heaven. I want to go to heaven. I want to go to heaven not just to stay out of hell. I want to go to heaven. I think there are some people who would like to go to heaven, but if they didn't have to be faithful to God, they surely would not. You take hell out of the equation and some would never show up again. That's because we don't love God. God doesn't yet have our hearts. But we need a strong faith then. We need to build our faith. So faith is the victory as we think about it. So as we think about the victory that we have through our Lord Jesus Christ, faith is the victory. Let's ask the question though, what is faith? Since faith is the victory, this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith, we need to ask, what is faith? Well, friends, faith is not man's opinion. A lot of people have opinions, don't we? And sometimes we're right in our opinions, but in the final analysis, it may just be an opinion, a way of doing something or a choosing of something. But a lot of times people will use opinion as though it is biblical faith. And they say, oh, I'm just doing this by faith. No, you're doing it by your opinion. I love what Brother Garland Elkins used to say. Faith is the transgression of God's law. It's not the transgression of your opinion. <laughs> but we all can get some strong opinions. Have you ever been around a strongly opinionated individual? It's hard to get along with that person, isn't it? Because he's always right. His opinion is that which should be followed. But might I remind us that faith is not our opinion. Okay? Also, faith is not man-made traditions. Jesus says in Matthew 15 in verse number 3, Why do you transgress the law by keeping your traditions? Some people will transgress God's law because they have certain traditions that they like, and they follow them rather than the Word of God. We talked about this morning over in the Far East how that there's a traditional worship, then it gets into a tradition and hard sometimes to get people out of worshiping their ancestors because it's traditional, it's handed down, the family expects them uh, to do that. And we may have certain traditions. Some traditions are not bad. The word tradition really just means handed down, something that is handed down. And there can be good traditions. There can even be the inspired traditions that Paul spoke of, that which was handed down from Christ through the Holy Spirit, through the apostles. Well, but they're inspired traditions. But we're talking about traditions that we might come up with, and I suppose nothing wrong with some of them, as long as it does not violate God's law. But when it comes down to tradition versus God's will, friends, we always better listen to God, had we not? Jesus said, you transgress, the Jews do, you transgress God's law by keeping your own traditions. Also, of course, we really should know this, that faith is not the doctrines of men. Matthew 15 again, verse number 9. 
Howbeit in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrine the commandments of men. Sadly, many people in the world do not know why they believe what they believe. They do not know where it originated. Some of them don't even know what they believe. They just go through some religious activities. We need to do like those noble Bereans and receive the word with all readiness of mind and search the scriptures daily whether or not those things are so. Now Paul says, or Luke wrote, recorded, he says that this is a noble thing to do. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica. Why? Why, they received the word with all readiness of mind. Friends, am I ready to receive the word of God? You know, it's hard to learn something new if I don't have an, uh, the attitude of I want to know the truth. Hard to learn the truth if I'm just closed-minded and will not receive that which is written. And so we need to investigate. Am I following the doctrines of men or am I following the word of God? Also, God defines faith for us. So we're interested from God's standpoint then, what is faith? Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Okay? I haven't seen it. I haven't seen God. I haven't seen heaven. I know that it is there, though. Why? There is evidence of it. Faith, then, is not a leap in the dark. Faith is not going on assumption. Faith is based on evidences. Faith in God is based on evidences. What I do in worship by faith is based on biblical evidences. And so it is then we need evidence for what we do. We need a thus saith the Lord for what we do. Once we establish that, number one, there is a God, evidence proves that. Secondly, that his word is the word of God, evidence proves that. Now then, I have a standard by which to go. I, yesterday, I uh, spent some time with a friend of mine who is a uh, surveyor. And he goes and he does a lot of surveying. He said, it's interesting at times. He said, people get mad at me because they want their property lines to be what they think that it is rather than what the standard is. He said, I will go and I'll go uh, get the uh, various plats and the deeds, as it were, where it's laid out, at least not the deed, but the plats of the neighbors. And I, and I establish where the boundaries are. And then I will shoot a line and find out his boundaries and where the uh, stakes are. He said, sometimes people will say, no, that's not the way I want it. I want this over here, and I want this over here. He says, well, sir, I, this is what the standard is. Uh, this is what's done by it being surveyed. But you know, that's the way it is when religion sometimes. We want what we want. And no matter what the standard says, we want it to be different. That's not evidence. That's just what man wants. You see, man has an opinion sometimes about property lines. Man also can have opinions about God's property lines, if you will. Interestingly, God says, remove not the ancient landmarks. But anyway, faith is based on evidence. Most everything we settle in the world is based on some form of evidence, isn't it? Property lines. Standards of authority. Uh, so we know then evidence is very important. The Bible tells us how we obtain this faith. In Romans chapter 10 and verse number 17, the Bible says, So then faith cometh by what? Hearing. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Faith doesn't come by suppositions. Faith doesn't come by feelings. Faith comes by hearing the word of God. But you say, I felt it in my heart. That's not the question. The question, you know, you can get some wrong information. And you'll feel things in your heart based on the evidence you got. Jacob thought Joseph was dead, did he not? But Joseph wasn't dead. Eve was deceived, thinking it's okay to eat of that fruit. But she was deceived. She got wrong information. She obeyed the wrong information. 
Faith then cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. If we want to have victory then, friends, we need to hear the Word of God. On the day of Pentecost, in Acts chapter 2, after that Peter had preached this marvelous sermon, in which he gave the evidence from Old Testament that Jesus is the Son of God, and he says, You have taken, and by wicked hands, you have crucified and slain, The Bible says this, now when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts and said unto people, uh, unto Peter and to the rest of the people, man and brethren, what shall we do? Notice, if you will, now when they heard this. It didn't say now when they felt this. It says when they heard this. They created faith in them. They realized then that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And consequently then, they were pricked in their hearts. They were pricked in their hearts by the word of God. Friends, that's what will lead us to repentance. Is when we're pricked in our hearts. Let's note also, we've noted what faith is. Faith is based on evidence. Faith comes here by hearing the word of God. But it's always helpful to have some demonstrations, isn't it? Illustrations, examples of people who had faith and were commended of their faith. Then I have not only a definition of it, but I have a demonstration of it. And so we have faith demonstrated for us in the word of God. I think of people like Abel. The Hebrews writer tells us in Hebrews 11 and verse number 4, That by faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by the which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gift, and by it he being dead, yet speaks. By his actions he's still speaking to you and me today. What is he telling us? He says that when we come to worship God, we need to worship the way that God wants us to worship, because you see his brother did not worship that way, Cain. But by faith, Abel offered a more excellent sacrifice. But now, how does faith come? Well, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. How did Abel then offer it by faith? He listened to what God said. And the clear implication then is, Cain did not. Cain did not listen to God. And not only did he not listen to God, he got angry with God. He got angry with the brother who was worshiping according to God's will. And he ultimately kills his brother and then lies to God. You see, we must have a proper attitude. I learned from Abel then that faith is demonstrated when I hear God and do what God says to do the way God says to do it. I think about Enoch. In Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number 5, by faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death. He says because God translated him. Then he goes on to say, for before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Now, how was he translated by faith? Well, God translated him, but why did he translate him? Because he had this testimony that he pleased God. Now how do you please God? You please God by listening to God and walking in harmony with God's will. I learned then, Enoch pleased God. I learned also that Noah demonstrated his faith. Hebrews 11 and verse number 7, by faith Noah being warned of God as things not seen as yet, what did he do? He moved with fear and prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became a mayor of righteousness, which is by faith. Face the victory. Was Noah victorious? Yes, he was. Was Abel victorious? Yes. Was Enoch victorious? Yes. Faith is the victory, isn't it? They faced their battles. They faced the conflicts that were there. And they listened to God, didn't they? And so they acted upon that. And this would be no small task building this ark. Some 450 feet long, a football field and a half in length, three stories high. It'd be uh, a huge vessel to build. But the Bible says he did it in Genesis 6, 22. The Bible says, thus did Noah 
according to all that God commanded him, so did he. Thus did Noah, according to all. But I thought he built it by faith. Well, he did. But the same Bible that tells us he built it by faith tells us he built it by obedience. What am I learning then about biblical faith? And we could go on and on giving other examples in Hebrews chapter 11. We'll not take the time to do that today. But all of these illustrate that faith is active, obedient faith. The faith then that is victorious is an active, obedient faith. Well, we realize that. When we say, while well, someone is very faithful, what are we talking about? We're talking about their actions, aren't we? While he is faithful, we're talking about he's full of faith. And it's demonstrated by the way he lives or she lives, by the way he or she listens to the word of God and is obedient thereunto. All of this shows then that is an active, obedient faith. James 2, 24 says, You see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. Faith only is not victorious, but faith is victorious. A active, obedient faith. Let's think about now, in closing, faith's victory. Faith's victory. John speaks of overcometh the world. What does that mean to overcome? It means to conquer. You know, I, I think we live, if we're not careful, almost in fear of the world. We look at society around about us and we talk about how bad the world is. We listen to the politics and, and the things that are going on in this world. And there's a lot of, a lot of bad things happening in the world. And we almost feel defeated if we aren't careful. But friends, I believe we ought to be victorious. We ought to feel victorious. Oh, the evil things are still going to be out there. I don't think that simply because I preach this sermon that all of a sudden all of the evil things that are happening in this world are going to cease. But I believe I can still be victorious in an evil world. I believe you can be victorious. The church can be victorious in this evil world. I look back in the days of the first century and I think it was more evil going on then than what it is now. And yet we find that the church was victorious. It means to conquer. So allow, rather than allowing the world to conquer me, I, through faith, through our Lord Jesus Christ, will conquer the world, spiritually speaking. Jesus says, In the world you shall have tribulation, conflict. But be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. John 16 and verse 33. We serve a victorious God, don't we? I think about the great universe that he has created. And if you go to the uh, Creation Museum sometime and sit in that film that they show you the world and just how small we really are in compared to the rest of God's universe, has he lost his power? No. Is anything taking God by surprise? No. God is still God. God is still victorious. And we're his children. Therefore, we have that confidence in serving God. The word that is translated overcometh, the, word, the same word is translated prevailed in Revelation 5.5. 5. It is translated conquering, Revelation 5.5. 5. It is translated again, conquer, in Revelation 6, in verse number 2. It is translated victory, in Revelation 15, 2. You see then the great optimism that I find in the Word of God relative to us overcoming the evils that are, we are facing as we go out here and live every day, the, where we work every day and every week, we just can feel defeated. But he says, this is the victory that overcometh the world even our faith. Now then, what world are we talking about in 1 John 5, 4? We're not talking about the physical universe. I'm not interested in trying to overcome the, the nature of this world. 
But we're talking about the evils of this world. 1 John 2, 15 through 17. Remember what he says. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. You see, that's the world we're overcoming. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. These are, that's the world that we're overcoming. This is the victory then that overcometh the world, even our faith. You see, friends, our faith has a reward. Our faith has a reward. If you will be faithful, you will recognize that victorious reward in some, not only in everyday life, but ultimately at the end of life. Notice what Peter says in uh, 1 Peter 1, 9, when he says, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your soul. Our faith has a reward. Now, why did I say the word uh, reward? Because it's the word end translated in your Bible. But it comes from the Greek word teleos, which means a reward, a completion. Receiving the completion, that's why it's translated end. That's the end of it, the, the design of it, if you will. Your faith has a design. Your faith has a purpose. Receiving then the reward of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. You're going to live on. The final victory is realized in heaven. We keep on overcoming as we live in this world by, by faith. We have an end or a design, if you will, of our faith. And notice how Paul worded it in 2 Timothy 4, 6 through 8. Notice, he doesn't sound like somebody who's defeated. It may be that Nero was thinking he was defeating Paul when he uh, took off his head, as tradition says it. But Paul put it this way in 2 Timothy 4, 6 through 8. I finished my course. I kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give to me at that day. And not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. When it comes the time to us to quit the walks of men, we can still be victorious. Though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. While we look not on the things which are seen, but on the things which are not seen. For the things which we see, he says, are temporal, but those things that are not seen are eternal. And so there's the victory that we have ultimately. And so Paul doesn't sound pessimistic. Paul doesn't sound defeated. He sounds very victorious because he had kept the faith. He had finished the course. He had fought a good fight. So it is, friends, we need to finish the course. We need to keep the the faith and we need to fight the good fight so that we can say when it comes time to lay down our armor faith is the victory thanks be unto God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ Romans tells us or Paul tells us in Romans that we are more than conquerors through him that loved us did you know the word that's translated more than conquerors is one word. And if you were to put it into, I guess you'd say transliterate it into English, it would be super conqueror. <laughs> More than conquerors, hyper conqueror, super conqueror. We are more than conquerors through him that loved us. You can have that victory, friends. You can have the victory that is in Christ Jesus. Thanks be to God then that gives us that victory.
victory in, in Christ. It may be that you're here today and you said, I want to be victorious. I want to be obedient to God. I want to have that biblical faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. We learn from the Word of God that sin separates us from God, and yet God says if we'll repent, we won't perish. But if we don't repent, we will perish. Luke 13, 3 and verse number 5. That's why he told them on the day of Pentecost, repent and be baptized. Not just be baptized, but repent and be baptized. We confess that Jesus is the Christ. Acts 8 and verse 37. We believe with our, all of our heart that indeed he is the Son of God. And upon that great confession, we are immersed in water for the remission of our sins. We're baptized far unto the remission of our sins. Acts 2 and verse 38. We learn in Acts 2, 47 that the Lord adds us to his church. Nobody votes on us. God adds us to his church. He puts us in that called out group of people that belong to him. And then we start our journey and we live by faith. We have a standard by which we go and we live by it every day. It's the word of God. Faith is the victory. And when it comes to the time that you'll quit the walks of men, as we all will one of these days, you can say, I've fought a good fight. I've finished the course. I've kept the faith. Henceforth, there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord will give me. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, if you need to be restored, if you want the prayers of the church, won't you come as together we stand as we sing this song of invitation?